Do physical states evolve? Do physical constants evolve? Do the laws of physics evolve? These are the questions. John Harland leads our physics study group at Math for Wisdom. You may have seen the video about his research program, Extra Dynamical Evolutionary Foundations for Physics. And we have this concept of evolution, we want to bring in our biologists. Jerry Northrup will speak first. He leads our Language of Wisdom study group. He's a pioneer in ecotechnology with a PhD in biophysics, practically speaking, molecular biology. Daniel Friedem, Friedman has just completed his postdoc in uh, biology at uh, UC Davis. He's uh, uh, passionate about ant colonies and he uh, is the, a founder and president of uh, the Active Inference Institute. So he'll speak after Jerry. John will then absorb and radiate uh, uh, ideas about evolution. We'll have open discussion. And then I will give um, concluding remarks remaining this to wondrous wisdom. I am Andres Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. <laughs> Jerry, uh, please, your remarks. Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start out by saying that I really enjoy uh, the two-hour video that uh, you and John had here a while ago and the interactions that I've had so far with John's work. I really appreciate his approach, the kinds of questions he is asking and the way he is going about exploring those. I find a lot of, of resonance in, in hope for that. So. Uh, mm -hmm. I congratulate John on the work you're doing, and I think it's very important. Oh, that's encouraging. Thanks. Um, to, to start out, I think um, I want to reference a couple of the questions or issues that were explored in that, that last talk, and that had to do with the interfaces uh, between the observer and the observed, the experimenter on the first case. And sort of the way I'm going to explain that or talk about that, and I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, is that I see the, the question is it should be the observer, should be observing the observer who is doing the experiments and not just the experiments themselves. And this relates again back to the a similar kind of interface question between the actuality and the possibility. And I see that is, is, again, looking at it from an observer. You have an experimenter who has formulated some possibilities. They drive the construction of an experiment, uh, which results in some actualities. But the question is, the observer's uh, formation of the possibilities may be influencing uh, the actuality that the experiment generates as interpreted by the observer, the experimenter. So that's a little obtuse, but we'll come back to that at, at the end. So my, my initial thought here was how do I explain a biologist's view of evolution to mathematicians and physicists in 10 minutes? And I thought initially what I would do was put on my uh, microbial ecology hat, and I would talk about uh, large microbial systems that are like a swamp or a wastewater treatment plant or a timber fish system uh, where you've got a complex uh, changing system resides in a, a continually changing sort of environment. How do you deal with that? And so looking at it from the microbial basis, let's say we have a system with 10 to the 18th individual bacterium in it. And each bacterium has a million base pairs per genome, 10 to the six. Uh, we'll say they have a generation time for reproduction of somewhere between 10 to the third and 10 to the six, a thousand to a million seconds. So it's uh, an hour to 10 days, roughly, something like that, depending on the thing. You also have a spontaneous mutation rate, and then every time uh, DNA replication occurs, uh, the base pair replicates in 10 to the ninth times, and there will be a mistake. An error is made. Uh, it doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Um, and you put all this sort of stuff together, you get a, 
a standard evolution mutation rate of 10 to the ninth genetically new bacterial genomes or ideas or hypotheses generated per second. This is an enormously powerful biocomputer in, in that sort of sense. But it's more than that, because in addition to this point mutation mechanism, you have a variety of other recombinant DNA uh, processes going on. There's have to be chunks of DNA floating around either inside cells or outside, and these sometimes get incorporated. It's called uh, transformation uh, and incorporated into the DNA. You have uh, bacterial sex, a conjugation, where one bacterial cell will put out a tube and actually inject some DNA into a different uh, bacteria. Uh, you also have uh, transduction, which is, involves viruses. Virus will uh, infect a cell, uh, replicate a lot of viral copies, break it out. Sometimes this uh, the, the new virus cells will contain some of the uh, DNA from the host bacterium. So when it infects another cell, sometimes it doesn't kill the other cell, the cell survives, but that DNA floats around and gets incorporated into the genome. So you've got an awful lot of, of uh, creative events. The uh, hypotheses or the ideas that are represented by the microbial genome are changing in certain predictable ways, but then in some ways that are really totally unpredictable, unexpected. And the situation gets worse in these big eco-reactors because you've got predators which evolve uh, from the inside, the, the viruses. From the outside, you get protozoa, uh, larger organisms, multicellular organisms that eat the bacteria. And then the protozoa die and they become a new force, a new food source for additional bacteria. And so this all goes on. And this is a, a process that involves a lot of really unexpected events. Um, and it goes, goes then as to what survives and, and that becomes evolution. So the question is, is why? Why is all this happening? And my initial answer is, well, it's fun. Uh, you know, girls just like to have fun. I think that's probably an unexpected answer here. Uh, so let me give you some more totally unexpected answers to evolutionary questions. And I apologize in advance for the unexpected language that will go along with it. But I am a biologist. I spend most of my time with manure. So it just comes with the territory. And I could go back to in college, we used to joke around with an animal we called the swoose. It was the meanest animal in the jungle because it had a mouth at both ends which means it couldn't shit, it didn't have an asshole. Uh, and that really can make you mean. And if you don't understand that, you just have to wait a while as you get older, you, you do. Um, so that kind of then brings the question up of maybe evolving animals or systems of any sort have to have a mouth and an asshole. Um, so let's take some examples. Take a wood stove. Now, I'm not sure that wood stoves evolve. They might, but you feed the wood into the stove. Uh, you get ashes out of the stove. So it's an in, input-output system, but it's also you get warmth from that. Uh, you take some of the bioreactors. If you feed a certain bioreactor grapes, you might get wine. That's great. If the bioreactor is a sewage treatment plant and, and you feed it sewage, you get sludge. Uh, comes comes in and out. Um, if we go then and then look at, at people, as a model, you feed people wine and food, uh, they, they get some warmth, it's kind of like the stove, um, they have fun, and they, um, they excrete, they, they get some shit out, which goes into the toilet, which is the mouth of the wastewater treatment plant, which goes to that bioreactor, and, and the cycles go on. So now the question comes as to, what is this fun part? Uh, why does that go? And it, it comes back, I think, to its art, its music, its dance, its poetry, its math, its science. It's the stuff that we do. Uh, it's, it's why we go through all these processes and that sort of stuff. And so then we can, can look and act and, or ask the questions of what do these things eat? What does art eat? What does music eat? Uh, what do they excrete? Where's the mouth and the asshole for mathematics? Where's the mouth and the asshole for physics? 
does this does this mean anything? It's a perspective of looking at it where you think all of these things are are alive, they're conscious and 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 they go back into the kind of stuff that we're looking at in in math for wisdom. So kind of comes back to these uh, initial questions of the interface between the observer and the observed uh, and the need to include the notion that maybe all of this is conscious, all of it, everything is an observer and an observed. We need to look at, we need to observe the process that the observer uses to construct and do the experiments which become the observed, which we then interpret as being actualities, as something that's out there that's real. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You go back to this notion of the actualities versus the possibilities. And the possibilities are created by an observer, an experiment, which is then going to do an experiment to determine quote unquote actualities. But these experiments and the actualities they determine may be heavily influenced by the um, nature of the observer themselves, who's both doing the experiment and observing the result. So that's kind of the way I look at evolution. And I think that's probably very different than what you would normally expect. It comes back to these questions of our electrons and protons conscious and what have you. I was, um, I was talking about this a little bit a while ago with my wife, Lynn. The evolutionary questions came up, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, her answer was the chicken. Answer you probably haven't heard before. Mm. So anyway, that's kind of my take on evolution. And, and that's the way I would sort of try to explain it to mathematicians and physicists. And I'm not sure it makes any sense to you at all. But there it is. I Thank you, uh, Jerry. That was very creative and fun. And uh, it spawns a lot of questions. So we'll hold off on the questions for now. We'll give it to Daniel, and then we'll let John, and then we'll, I, I have questions to bring. Thank you, Jerry. Please, Daniel. But we don't hear you now, but uh, you're muted. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Interesting and hilarious. About the... Uh, interfaces, I think that'll be a great topic to return to. And I'm reminded of figure 9.1 from the active inference textbook, where we have the subject and the cognitive map or the cognitive model that we're making of the subject of the experiment. However, also we recognize that we're in a dashed line and that can continue to be nested. And the observations for the subject are the actions of the experimenter and then the behavior of the subject or the observations for the behavioral researcher. Um, I think another topic I'm really curious to explore is what does evolution mean? I'm wondering in quantum, is this referring to simply change? Is that change in something that's observed? However, observations do not really change, like unless our data changes without us looking. The observations are sequential, though unchanging. And so are we talking about something else that is changing, like the extra dynamical dimensions or the, the hidden states? And then in biology, sometimes evolution is used in an overlapping sense as simply change. And there's a lot to explore with this multi-level change, change that's happening at the real time, second by second, like behavior and perception, organism scale. And then that which happens over the lifetime. And then sometimes people hold out evolution, as in like evolution by natural selection, to refer to specific situations where you have, for example, heritable variation in phenotype associated with heritable variation in reproductive fitness. And then if it's not those conditions being met, it's change, but oh, that's not evolution. So what does it mean to, to evolve? Um and I think there's a few ways that that quantum and biology touch and, and co-inform, not exhaustive here. There's the most mechanistic in terms of the quantum phenomena in biological systems related to like electromagnetic navigation and microtubules, a lot of other 
uh, materials properties. There's also ways in which people are starting to use quantum statistical methods within a given scale of analysis, like on the exact same data set that they would apply some other descriptive statistics to, applying quantum methods to respect, for example, the fact that in a psychology experiment, the sequence of observations matters for the person making decisions. So it can't be said that those behaviors that the person are making are like IID because they actually are part of a, a richer world trace. And then also a really exciting area that's developing is using some of the scale-free formalisms like the topological quantum uh, formalisms and some of the category theory there to give a better architecture that's more flexible and composable for multi-scale biological systems. Just like Jerry pointed to, if we were interested in like the metabolic activity or even a higher order properties like resiliency for a microbial biofilm, we would need to model it at multiple timescales. Like we can't have the pH be basically fine 99% of the time and then quickly drop it to pH one just, just once in a while. It's like, it will matter. So how do we think about these, these very rich um, patterns of historiosity in the biological systems, which to simplify, physics sometimes strives to expunge. Like if you're testing the melting point of a material, it might help to kind of abstract or like partition off the history of that material. We just want the sample of sulfur to melt at this temperature and to have that be the basis of the reproducibility. However, that's a lot more complex when, when even in this case, like the exploration of just the DNA state space is so vast, even without getting into the epigenetic, metabolic, morphological, electrical state spaces. Um, Andreas also uh, kind of took a meta-scientific angle with this uh, third transition in science paper building on many works over the decades by Stuart Kaufman. And here I found this diagram very interesting. I think we could kind of return to it, but it speaks again to this idea that all biological systems are composite at the scales that we know and love them at and, and scales above that and scales below that. There isn't like some kind of element to purify. There's this tension that has always been in the, in the background to the foreground in biology about animism and vita, vitalism and about how, how do we make sense of the, the Kantian whole, which is to say the end of itself, the, the thing for which it has a closed teleology, how do those kinds of things and all the other properties we associate with them, like self-reconstructing, autopoetic, or self-meaning making, the biosemiotic, how do those kinds of complex systems with their real or apparent downward causation come to be when a reductionist or a materialist take might say there's nothing here but the physicality. So how do we, is that what we need? Do we need something different? Um, and then this, this third transition in science points to at, at the philosophy of science level how how will we think about the fundamental multi-scale nature um and biology has always kind of brought these questions to the fore because there are phenomena that that are empirical and also very elusive um to kind of give one ant connection i find it really interesting that that People talk about ants as super organismal. There's a Wikipedia page on it. And that implicitly reifies the Nesme as organismal. 
because the colony is the one super to it. However, going back to some of the earlier, like 1911 work, it was discussed in the Kantian organismal sense that the ant colony is just an organism. And so then there's no need to go super because it is the level at which things are an end in of themselves. And so are all interfaces and bounded things ends to themselves? Are we talking about certain ends in and of themselves such that it like doesn't make sense to talk about an organelle or a, a cellular component as being like a quantum observer? But then what is that quantum observer? Is it all systems regardless of what impression the measurements make on them? Is it only ones that have some other kind of level of sophistication in their in their measurement or in their preparation apparatus? Um, and then I think that the the last piece and where I saw not just the evolution as change in John's um, earlier talk with Andreas, but also this notion of there's all the paths that could be unfolding from a system at a given time, like the mutational adjacencies. And then there's this pruning. There's the trace of what actually does happen. And then this one half pruning i really want to understand like what it is and because in biology with fluctuating populations when we think about pruning there might be a time when the pruning is higher or lower like selective pressure being relaxed or selective pressure being applied like in an agricultural setting so a lot of the formalisms around evolution and change have to do with like how does a system or or system of systems respond or react when there's different intensities of selective pressures applied because it's kind of understood that selective pressures are basically they're never constant so then how do we reconcile this with this with the kind of pruning by a constant and I think it's a fun topic. So I'm just looking forward to exploring more here. Thank you, Daniel. Very intensely deep, stimulating. And so Jerry and Daniel have uh, built bridges from the biology world towards the physical world. And now we'll ask John to help build a bridge back maybe we'll meet somewhere or not but we'll be trying so john um thank you for your research program for uh giving this the opportunity to be together and we uh, invite your remarks questions ideas uh, responses yeah <clears throat> so thank yeah thank you daniel and thank you jerry um it was really really interesting um and i have to admit i'm i'm ignorant of the details of biology i know the you know sort of the big picture stuff um but you know i know that biological mechanisms are incredibly complex they're you know the most maybe the most complex mechanisms amenable to rigorous scientific study at, at, at the present um and uh, so <laughs> in physics, you know, and in mathematics, we deal with much simpler models. Um, and so trying to upscale these simple models into something as complex as a biological environment to me is, is extremely challenging and brilliant and, and, uh, and really interesting. Um, but kind of beyond my ability to think creatively in that in that regime. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to talk to you. Um, so I, I guess, uh, you know, can I assume that we've all watched that conversation, uh, between you and you and me and it, and I, you know, I have to admit, I, I kind of forgot some of the details. Uh, you know, we did talk about the upper triangularity of, of certain dynamical systems. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe I can, Maybe I can review that to some extent. Would that be would that be helpful? Yeah, you can to... share your screen if you like. Yeah. If okay. Can... Yeah. Okay. I I just and that would speak to us. Um, 
This is about dy dynamical systems, how they can break uh, into like with a matrix uh, and yeah, yeah. you can have a flow of um, effect, let's say causality of one part right. and the yes. other parts. So it's a very simple model for the flow which, of causality. Which may or kind of speak to uh, some of the things uh, Jerry was saying. Like, I think one of the themes that I heard is that uh, we, um, in the, to understand evolution, it may be helpful to think of the context. You know, what are these living systems? What do they have in common? So even as Jerry said, so fundamentally basic is this input output, which does bring to mind uh, active inference uh, that you have, let's say, sensory input, you have action, you know, output. And so when I heard about input output, I did think about uh, what John talks about, like unitary evolution. You have self-adjoint operators, like can things that make sense in one direction also make sense in the opposite direction? Okay, so that's something to make. But these, uh, tri these uh, matrices that I think John will be drawing for us, um, They'll they'll have that uh, sense of um, going from inputs to outputs, having those, uh, or like when we talk about uh, active inference, we have Markov blankets. We have, I think, basically like matrices uh, modeling uh, dynamics, and so this is very much in that flavor. Okay, are you and able so, to share your screen? Good. Yeah, and really, I think I think it's best. And can you see my writing here? Yes. Uh, am I, but am your I, screen is very large for me. I don't know if it's it just is. me, but yeah. It probably is you, because uh, it's okay. fitting on my, yeah. Yeah, I don't think I'm magnified here. It's good, yeah. Okay, okay great. Um, so, you know, in, a, in do I need to review how, I'm not sure what level I need to review this. Like, can I do I need to review how a matrix can model a dynamical system, a discrete dynamical system, or are we all on board with that? I think you can assume that, and then we'll explain more if necessary. So, you know, you can think of this as a Markov process. You can think of it as a self-adjoint matrix that that is the, um, you know, the generator of a unitary flow. Um, I, you know, there's, you know, there's different different ways you can you can use a matrix to model a dynamical system. But um, in, you know, in physics, uh, you know, just there's a way of going from this matrix to the actual time evolution, you know, the, the, the time evolution of the system is given by another matrix use of T, which depends on time, the time parameter. And in physics, if we use self-adjoint matrices, it's quite simple just going to the, time evolution like this and you have to make sense of what this object means but you know there's a well-defined way of 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 um evolving that object uh in terms of a many ways to do it but one way is using an infinite series um anyway and you know this is not really uh so much important how we how we manip manipulate you know um say a discrete system into a continuous system um what is important though i think from for our point of view is does this matrix really model the dynamical system or is it only kind of a pseudo model in the sense that it is predictive up to it up to a certain extent and then there's something else that kind of creeps in that kind of complicates the issue. And I think that the answer, I think, in any dynamical modeling is that uh, in physics or biology or whatever, is that we don't know how to write down the ultimate matrix. We don't know how to 
write down the time evolution of the universe. Um, we don't know what the states are that we should be modeling. We don't know the big picture. All we know is small pictures. Okay. So really, when we talk about a dynamical system, you know, we're talking about some piece of a dynamical system that's embedded in a larger system. And again, this should should kind of echo back to So, um, and I wish I'd, if you don't mind, I'm going to change the name of this to be B because that's just the way I normally do it. But um, nah, let's just use M. That's okay. I can do it. Okay. So M is actually part of a larger matrix. And there's some part of the matrix here. And let's say there's some part of the matrix here. And then this is kind of questionable here. And if you look at how a matrix like this would act on a on a state, um, suppose that there's you know the state space is divided into two uh, two parts here, S one and S two. M acts in a few you know the way of normal matrix multiplication. M acts on S two, but there's a larger space that's really at play here, which is the sum, you know, the vector sum of S1 and S2. So these are subspaces. And what's happening is this submatrix is taking states in S2 and moving, moving, moving them up to affect stuff in S1. So is this all... Uh, so far, is this just review for, or we should I slow down, or I, I don't know. I don't know if this is clear to people uh, that, you know, you just have so to So this about is a consequence of matrix multiplication, right? Like this matrix multiplication. Maybe, yeah. maybe could you just um, multiply those two together and show what it would look yeah. like, right? Like so something is just, just very multiply you together, you got AS1 uh, plus whatever this, matrix is here and on the bottom here you get uh maybe something times s1 plus m s2 and if this is if this is absent like if it's zero mm -hmm. if it's zero then what that means is that in this slot here the only relevant um dynamics is given by m And if you repeated if it, is, you would get M squared, and then next time right, M cubed. That's right. and, M, and that's very much, I think, like an active inference, that's a very, at least in Markov situations, that's very much the type of setup. Uh, right. And it's the same setup in, in unitary dynamics. So if this part is missing, then you get a simple action of this larger dynamics on the smaller subsystem given just by M. So in a sense, you can ignore the larger environment. Because it can be, it's like effectively isolated. It's not it's really not, impacted by it. It is. Now the, the, the smaller environment, S2, does affect the larger environment, but there is no flow going backwards if the question mark is not there, if the question mark is equal to zero. And it's affecting back because of that the asterisk star. That's is right. The, it's, it's, it's feeding back into the upper. Yeah, this this is the feedback from the smaller environment into the larger environment. The forward, you know, so the smaller environment, you know, what happens in the smaller environment can affect the larger environment. But if this part is missing, if this part is zero, then the larger environment can't affect the smaller environment. So that's what I would call like a perfect niche. Um, and also, um, so I'm just going to call this, uh, let's just call this, uh, uh, the larger matrix, let's just call this T, is the larger um, the larger matrix acting on S1, S2. And and just to jump in, but like I have this picture of an ideal organism. So like in this model that Jerry described, if you think of the smaller system as what consists from the uh, mouth to the uh, 
hole, let's say, what's inside there is like this smaller system. It's like an ideal world. Like in an ideal biology, once you eat something, it's safe inside and it's it's not affected by the outer world. You know, in the ideal biology, once you eat something, it's yours, it'll go out, nothing will ever happen. Of course, in the real world, you know, you could get cut in half by a bird or something. Uh, and and then it's all changed. But in an ideal world, you know, what you ate is yours, you're processing it, it's in an internal life. And when you think of something like symbiosis, like once a cell swallows a bacteria and has a nucleus, for that nucleus, it lives in this smaller world. It knows nothing about the outer world, perhaps, let's say. You get this type of uh, in theoretical insularity. Yeah, I think of this more like... Um more like a niche that's sort of perfect and safe for an organism like a right uh, but so but, but then also the organism it, could it, be the niche it, for by for digestion let's say right but it's the same it, logic right the organism only has to look at its local environment to be able mm -hmm. to predict what's going to happen and it's kind of like a perfect world in the sense that there's this larger more chaotic world happening outside you but as long as you just focus on the variables within your own world, you're okay. You can do prediction. You can do whatever organisms have to do to survive. It's like a it's like a safe environment, you know. Like a sandworm in the desert doesn't have to worry about monkeys or something. Or like a like an ant doesn't have to worry about um, so much about humans until mm -hmm. we spray them, um, or step on them or you know it, it's a pretty isolated environment between like well I don't know um, I think of Ants kind of live in a niche. We live in a niche. The the crosstalk between those new two niches may not be that significant to an ant. Um, and uh, so, any questions so far? Now, if so, let's call this a perfect niche. S two is a perfect niche. Can you have the opposite state where there's a smaller environment? that doesn't affect upwards, but only a downward causation? Then you would just, uh, then I think you would just flip the whole thing. Um, so the smaller environment would actually be the larger environment in this model. Um, the whole thing would be, you just flip these two over and then you would end up with upper triangular. Daniel, I don't know if that did that. Did that seem like an answer to your question? I think I, I think I'm by definition saying the smaller environment is the one that affects the larger environment, but doesn't get affected by the larger environment. I think by definition. Um, so in this model, that's kind of the way it works. Um, now there may be biological situations where maybe you do want to flip it over, but I'm not sure that's consistent with this model but let me let me just um let me just say that if t is upper triangular then s2 is a perfect niche this subspace s2 is a perfect niche and then on the other hand if this question mark is not equal to zero in other words t is not upper triangular I think this is more realistic because I think very few, I mean, I'm not sure if the biologists know of anything that is a perfect niche that we never, never get, uh, you know, backward flow from the, up, from the larger environment. I just don't think that that probably doesn't exist in biology. Although maybe there's something on the bottom of the ocean, you know, some bent, you know, like on the bottom of the ocean where there's a completely isolated well, colony, or something, well, you know, something, or something that, I don't wonder if this is an example, but like, if you just think of an electron, right, or a proton, right, like, electron, proton, they're just not affected by their environment. I mean, you know, they don't, well, you you do have, let's say, radiation, you know, like you do have, so maybe that's not true. But biologically speaking, so to speak, uh, biology and chemistry don't affect a proton or electron as opposed to their composition or... In a certain sense, yeah. I mean, like in, in terms like of they can the, affect other things, right? Like they affect the environment, but they're not um, affected by their uh they they just stay what they are. 
Yeah, I'm not sure that's an analogy or not. I mean, it 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 it's interesting to think about. You know, you can think about also the forces of nature. There's a rough, you know, kind of breakdown of the force of nature in terms of the strength. You know, is the gravitational field really affected by the other fields? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, it operates at such a different scale. You know, that for for all intents and and purposes, maybe it is. You know, we do have kind of an upper triangular. Uh, breakdown for some of the force of nature although the elect the weak force and electromagnetic force do have quite a bit of crosstalk so that's i think was sort of the first unification that was done that you know an electro weak force was kind of created to replace the two separate forces but the strong force affecting the electro weak or affecting gravitational i think there is kind of a rough breakdown of independence there and so um, so just to maybe pursue that idea a little bit more like so if gravity is something that affects the other force you know things that are involved with the other forces but they don't affect they don't they have no impact on gravity really but biologically speaking i think humans have this pretension that we can affect the whole planet but the planet's not going to affect us in a you know i don't know if that's pretentious but that's how well, we want to yeah and and it, and i think that you know that that pretension might be part of the confusion of experimenter versus um experimental subject versus experimenter in quantum mechanics in other words how much agency do we really have over the initial states of quantum systems i mean that's an interesting question that i i think about i can't say i've made much progress in it but you know i think it is very you know very um necessary to stay aware of that particular dichotomy and and question whether we do have that kind of independence. Okay, so um, suppose that, you know, S is not upper triangular, then T to the N, I'm sorry, I'm using not the greatest notation here, but T to the N operating on S1, S2 gives you that. If you have pure upper triangularity, and if you don't, then T to the N operating on S1, S2 is going to look like stuff over the smaller system operating on S2 plus some stuff. In other words, this niche is imperfect. There's some crosstalk that, that results in a perturbation of pure dynamics on the smaller subsystem that somehow affects the smaller subsystem. So in other words, this M matrix is only a, is only an approximate theory of how the smaller su subsystem is going to evolve. So if, if some organism has some model for that, like a, you know, in other words, predictable uh, predictability model built into its neurophysiology or whatever um, it's going to be wrong some of the time because the larger environment is feeding back into the smaller niche and if it's wrong part of the time then presumably there's going to be some consequences like death or uh, some kind of pressure that uh, that and, and uh, even there's some, some kind of evolutionary pressure that that you know makes this smaller system want to evolve into something that somehow takes into account the larger system in a in a in a better way now maybe easier said than done right maybe maybe a an organism can exist in that in that partial niche in that in that in that imperfect niche for millions of years or billions of years and it just sort of the organism is good enough you know to to uh reproduce and to populate the niche and you know maybe there's some culling that happens every so often maybe this rears its ugly head and uh, there's uh, uh you know more selection at certain times than others and but maybe the organism yet persists in that niche because it's good enough you know like a shark uh, mm -hmm. I, I presume sharks haven't evolved that much for hundreds of millions of years so they're good enough you know so in other words this is a good enough theory for long-term survivability and and to link in with two themes from our uh pre-talks uh 
Jerry talked about um, error as an important cert, you know, variability that error is built into DNA uh, replication. So the whole idea of this stuff kind of like maybe a little bit related to error. Of course, you know, you're talking about a niche, but you know, within the niche, there's a niche, there's an organism, there's a, there's, you know, so that's one thing to think about. And another thing that uh, Daniel talked about was uh, with regard to Kant, this idea of ends for themselves, you know, what does it mean to be an end for yourself? So these perfect niches, what you call, uh, bring to mind these Kantian holes to say, like, you know, in, in Kant's ethics, he's saying people should not be treated as means to an end. People should be treated as ends to themselves, but maybe not just people, but frogs and uh, maybe maybe even bacteria, you know, could think, well, that they all have their own life, let's say. Um, so anything that in an ideal sense, maybe in a perfect world, is a perfect niche, so to speak, is an ideal sense. And then you you then have this feedback where, yeah, but sometimes it's used as an end, you know, I mean, a means, or sometimes it's participating in these causal relations. These are just ideas that are coming up. Trying yeah. To... yeah, so, it, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I think, lots of interesting questions about how you embed one system and another and, you know, what you consider the boundaries of the, of the system. Um, in a sense, this problem here um you know if m is good enough maybe this whole dynamics is not a problem if m is not good enough in other words if there's if this becomes a problem too often it seems that that would be sort of the equivalent of a lot of evolutionary pressure so maybe the organism tries to you know in a sense quote unquote tries um you know, there, there's some pressure to evolve into a larger dynamical model that would maybe subsume the environment, in which case then you would be in a niche again that was better, but maybe a larger, you know, a larger, more complex model of the dynamics of the environment that now takes into account this whole matrix rather than, rather than just this partial, this partial theory here, this partial, uh, just looking at the sub environment. And, and, and you maybe know. you can clarify, I'll maybe kind of ask a question or raise a point that uh, you've drawn very deliberately these uh, two by two matrices, but there's a way of looking at it in physics where it's just a bunch of relations, you know, it's just a one by, it's just a, this is matrix, but the dynamics uh, shows, reveals that there's this breakup. And so where to draw those lines of the matrix is actually, in a certain sense, a question. It's not obvious, you know, maybe that sorts itself out. Um, uh, you know, that's that's something to keep in thing that those lines aren't necessarily drawn in in advance or or am I wrong? Yeah, no, I don't I don't think they are. I think that, you know, part of the game of physics is to draw those lines. And, you mm -hmm. know, in a sense, you know, that's what we do in um physical laboratories is we isolate systems so that we can talk about a subsystem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, these are discoveries. These are, every time we learn how to isolate a system and, and, and focus in on it, that's a major advance in physics. For example, electricity or magnetism or realizing that they're different. Um, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, the early experiments of quantum theory or, you know, the more recent experiments at CERN, you know, I think every time we do that, we are doing this kind of, this, this kind of dicing up of nature. And these are major advances. These are not obvious um, how to do this at all. They take, you know, experience and work and, you know, uh, deliberation and it's generational type um, progress rather than, you know, even you know, this is progress made over generations rather than over, you know, the time scale of months or years. So these are major advances when we learn, we learn how to dice up, you know, um, physics in this way. Um, I do want to say, like, when I survey the ways of figuring things out in biology, one of the branches uh, in setting up uh, a system or like recognizing biological system is very much re recognizing, well, what's an organism? An organism is something that you can take out of the environment. And then, you know, you can, first of all, see it in the environment. Then you can take it out and, let's say, put it on a Petri dish or put it on a floor, let's say, or put it in a box. 
then you can um, study it in an artificial environment so that maybe it uh, is more quote unquote semi-natural and then you can put it back into a different environment see what changes so those are all aspects of um, uh, drawing those lines what is an organism and similarly with a niche you can kind of do the same game so biology has experience with this type of question i think yeah and did we did we talk about in that in that two hour talk that we did, do we talk about, you know, the two different kinds of adaptation here where you kind of adapt up where you, you go from M to this larger. Why, why don't you do that now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I mean, one way, you know, let's call this step one and step two here. So if step two causes enough evolutionary pressure so that um in a sense for long-term survivability this this um this theory here of just the smaller dynamics is not far from optimal um, and, and the way to think of it is like stuff to is impacts within the niche you know which used to be a perfect niche but now the perfect niche is kind of like affected by something and it's affected by stuff coming from outside is that right and so yes. it's forced to deal with it in its own niche it's forced to deal with stuff that is coming from the outside which could be sunlight or it could be you know new new creature predator yeah so it seems that it seems that there's two distinct possibilities here for evolution to you know two two directions it can go it can it can it can sort of upscale into oh say developing a photoreceptor that would somehow you know maybe if you if you take into account you know maybe the light coming from the environment that would that would be you know in this slot here uh then you kind of you kind of upgrade your dynamics to include a larger dynamics then you know So this would upgrade going from M to you know, a larger understanding of the environment, which would now say that you understand all these pieces, or at least you have a better model for them. And so, in other words, the <laughs> you know the the evolution is in the direction of increased complexity. Um, what what can you explain this picture because I don't understand. Well, in other but words, the M is on both sides. Yeah, because you know you started out. You started out with you know a an organism organism that just took into account the S two slot. In other words, the um, let me make this more explicit here m acts on s2 so in other words the organism eventually evolves into something else that now can take into account the full environment in other words or at least a fuller environment that in other words the model that was originally only focused on s2 now has elements that take into account the S1, S2 environment. In other words, we learn to model this, we learn to model this. And so we've kind of upgraded our dynamics into, now, you know, this may happen one dimension at a time. It may happen several dimensions at a time. I don't know. Um, but that would be what I call an upgraded dynamical model where you take into account more of the environment and you end up with a, um, a cogent model of the entire environment, in which case you now understand the stuff that's feeding back from the larger environment. In other words, you can now model it because you understand, you know, this and this and this. And this may be, like I say, only a one-dimensional, like in terms of modeling the, the state space, only a one-dimensional upgrade. 
into a into a larger environment in which case now the new game is this is now t we call this whole thing t and then we find out that t is not actually a complete theory and then you know the new game now is t is now embedded in a new you know a new rough and tumble dynamical environment where t is only a partial theory of that larger environment but it's an upgrade on what we had before because it has more predictability because this stuff here is now more predictable because we're and, and it could be something like a um insect learning to chirp or like a butterfly learning to cam camouflage itself so to speak like it makes these changes which are successful uh you know and so it doesn't get eaten as often let's say or a uh, organism developing a, a, a rudimentary photo de uh, detector mm -hmm. so that you know it now it now can adjust its behavior depending on whether the sun is out or not um so I don't know from bio biological point of view, this is very crude. I, you know, because I don't have I don't have many actual real examples or any real examples. Um but this is like a game theory type of setting, like that there's a game going I, I on so. and your strategy right. is uh, evolving. It's a, what so what's evolving is in a certain sense is almost like a strat like a strategic uh, strategic way weighing of your But there's another direction that evolution could take us and that maybe M, maybe this whole setup here, what we thought was um, the variables we needed to focus on, maybe that's too large. In other words, maybe there's some subsystem of M that is, uh, or S2, that is uh, more insulated from the environment. And if we just focus on that, in other words, kind of simplify the dynamics, then we get a better, we get a better factorization. In other words, there's less environmental feedback. So that would be kind of downgrading. And again, I don't know if there's examples of this in evolution, but I'm just saying this is a possibility. And so like an example of that in the wondrous wisdom would be this idea of having a conscious mind, like where you just reduce everything to a language of concepts you know you abstract away or like in the case of an ant colony you say well we're going to have this queen sit six feet underground where the temperature doesn't change and she's just going to learn about the world from smells that are carried through you know and collected and then she can give smells back but she's going to be very much insulated to a more select world so in in this case Perhaps there's, you know, a sub niche where, you know, some kind of a sub niche where you were looking at too much and now if you focus on this sub niche in other words this subspace i'm sorry s2 double prime then there's less environmental feedback could in you make words, the double prime more clear because it looks like a single prime yeah so in other words you were looking too broad and if you just focus on something smaller a smaller subsystem which is m2 And, and this raises the question, like, is this with regard to the system in terms of how it's modeling, or is it in terms of how we're drawing the lines, you know, in this whole thing? Like, it's in terms of understanding what's going on. Well, I think in the case of biology, it's kind of both, because biological mechanisms 
I mean, it seems to me they have to be able to predict, they have to be able to adapt, they have to, you know, kind of have a model for their environment. Um, and, and in here certainly seems... our, our, nerv our nervous system is an obvious example, but I mean, I think in, in the case of plants and I, I imagine um, animals, even animals without nervous systems have some kind of adaptive mechanisms and some kind of expectation on how their environmental time evolution is going to flow, right? I mean, it, but, the, and, but there's think, these very strong lines between the self and the environment, you know, between the organism and right. I mean, like that's what those lines are about, right? Yeah, like, except for if this is a question mark here, then it's not so. The the lines. Oh, are okay. Then the lines are more right? iffy, right? Yeah. Lines are iffy, right? Now, it could be that that you know the actual is like this right here, but this is a very small. influence here in other words it's smaller than the original than the original model that you had in which case it's a better it's a better model and if you just sort of occupy that niche or focus on that niche filter out everything else then there's more predictability so it seems like that's also a possibility again i don't you know i i don't know if there's examples of environment you know of evolution where a you know, an organism finds some sub niche that it's better suited to or evolves into a sub niche. It's more isolated from environmental and, influence. And there's this, I, there's I, this, imagine there are, you know. there's this tension here between whether you and the subsystem are one, you know, and you've got all these relations, whatever, and that then and really it's just all, you're all meshed in with the, with the world, or is there a very strong line between you? So, this idea of like opposites coexisting, like, you know, I am different from the environment, you know, I either live in a perfect niche or let's say I am a perfect niche, opposites coexist, or it's all the same, you know, we're kind of related, network, there's really no, ultimately no difference between me and my environment. So then when you model that, typically the model raises the question, if the model is for your survival, let's say, then you want to somehow divorce yourself from the environment, the model may be like a pure niche. Although like when we have a map of the m m body, let's say, and you take a hammer, the hammer joins your arm, you know, that's how it, you, you feel like your arm's been extended, but you don't feel like the whole world is part of your body. You know, you make this, you still have this, in the modeling of yourself, you have this firm distinction. So these ideas, like, are you a being unto yourself? Uh, do you have a notion of survival? you know, or thriving? Are you, or are you just, can you just be one with the environment? Can you have that attitude that I'll let go of myself, I'll be one with the environment? These are being framed by this, I think. Yeah, I think those are, those are good analogies. Um, so the question is, you know, I mean, uh, you know, did, does this somehow help, you know, bio, biological modeling? I don't know. But um, to me, it's the way I've used, you know, the inspiration of biology to try to explore, you know, to, to try to open up the discussion of physics, um, you know, the, the, the discussion of dynamical systems and physics. Um, um, the other, you know, the other, obviously, you know, this is this kind of two by two system is you know, extremely idealized. And in fact, you know, this would be embedded in a larger system, which would then be embedded in a larger system. So, you know, I don't know how to network these things, but ultimately, a, and as if, the, if this is a successful idea, it would have to somehow be networked into a larger system. And the question is what dynamical systems can be, can be broken down this way into a network of these kinds of things. And those are very special dynamical systems. Not every dynamical system can be done that way. So I guess what I would say is that maybe there's a possibility of a theory of dynamical systems that uh, certain systems, certain worlds are amenable to evolution and others are not. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are amenable to, to evolution are the ones that have these kinds of rough breakdowns. So can, we, can, can we switch over to discussion at this point? Is this a good yeah, and, 
And should I talk about the relation to physics or did we already do that enough? Why don't, why don't you add that in? Let's have some discussion a bit and then you can. Um, okay. And I just wanted to, uh, Daniel um, uh, mentioned in the chat and I would, uh, you know, about the three minds and active inference is something that I think uh, this speaks to. Active inference basically saying that uh, you have a, um, you, you have a dynamical system where like, you have inputs coming from the world and then, you know, which are sensory information. You have actions going out like that are outputting. And then you have, uh, apart from the world, you start to have something that is um, uh, doing its thing, let's say, with those inputs, uh, producing those outputs. But when it does the outputs, it basically like has two choices. It can... Um, if things are not matching up with its model, you know, based on the inputs, the inputs are saying things are not matching up according to expectations. It has the opportunity to, um, how can I say, I guess it can um, change what it, uh, it can, it can update what it saw, or it can move itself to maybe see what it wanted to see. You know, like there's these two abilities to respond. And the latter one's a little bit problematic because it basically you can get into this bias loop, you know, where you never snap out of it, you never learn. It. So the third, so these two minds are kind of present in this dynamic that you're drawing. But the crucial thing is a third mind that would say, hey, hey, don't get caught in a bias loop. If if you're getting this conflicting information, pick a way to look at these things so that you can actually um, be an honest a witness, you know, what's going on here. So how does a third mind kind of step in here? And that may be a part, maybe what it is is like this in the per perfect niche or in that M, let's say, it splits up into two parts where it has a uber mind, you know, an over mind that is looking and saying like, are you fair? You know, like, what are you doing? You know, is this really proper? So that's a comment uh, based on what Daniel said. And so maybe I'll ask uh, who would like to ask questions, give comments, uh, continue further. Including, and I want to say Thomas Gaidosik, physicist uh, is here from uh, the University and my father, Edmund Skoldekowskas. But we can start with some applause for uh, for uh, John. Thank you. And Thomas has a comment. Okay. Yeah, I I would like to know if the idea of applying that to to some extent fundamental particles or evolution does really make sense in the sense of having having it as something that we think is not really a subsystem but part of a subsystem that we cannot really characterize as a whole system, if it makes sense. On the other hand, I think the whole idea is, I think, a very good description of how we do research and how we do understand how, well, physics, the world, to split into what we do understand and how we do it better. So I really enjoyed the presentations. Thank you, John. Um so yeah, this might be about epistemology, you know, the theory of knowledge rather than ontology, you know, the theory of what what is and is not, you know, it maybe it is, you know. The question is what why is physics amenable to this kind of breakdown? Why is biology amenable to this breakdown? It says something fundamental about the universe, I think. I think it does say something ontologically about the universe. You know, why can there be parts that sort of operate sort of independently? Um, there's something there's something special going on here, you know, and because if you just take an arbitrary dynamical system, I think that, you know, it's almost a set of measure zero that would, my guess is that a set of measure zero would would break down this way. In other words, a very it's a very special setup that we find ourselves in. That's my hypothesis. I might be wrong, but you know, it just it seems to be maybe maybe we don't uh, you know I don't think we contemplate enough why there can be, even be intelligible subsystems uh, in the universe. Why is it all just so 
interconnected and so hellishly complicated that there is no subforms. I mean, that is true in a in an uh, like a a hot gas, for example, a plasma is hellishly complicated, right? I mean, the dynamics are so uh, you know you can only you can only deal with the 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 uh, uh, that that kind of a situation in a statistical way, but not in an individual dynamical way. And there are no, you know, in a plasma, uh, you know, it seems to me that, you know, the breakdown into system and subsystem is much, <laughs> is much less possible than it is in a sort of frozen out system that we find ourselves in that admits to biology and all the, all the, all the other wonderful structures that we see. So, there is something special and you know i think it you know can is it just simply dynamics uh statistical mechanics going on here and i think that certainly that is the ma major you know the majority view in physics that dynamical theory by itself is rich enough to describe the variety of concepts that you know a variety of objects that we see in subsystems maybe it is you know right. on the other hand i i think that you know a i guess i'm i lean toward an extra dynamical approach that there's some kind of a system breakdown that allows for uh this kind of semi upper triangular breakdown of nature together with a calling mechanism that allows you to focus on a on a particular you know subsystem and make makes a subsystem sort of its own entity not in a hundred percent fashion but in a in a in a fashion that is pronounced enough to be able to identify those subsystems so i want to uh, I, I guess my hypothesis is that dynamics alone is going to have a hard time explaining that maybe it will maybe ultimately statistical mechanics will triumph over that question but i have my doubts and that's why we said your research program is the extra dynamical evolutionary uh, foundation for physics uh, and the extra dynamical meaning there's meta levels possibly and so the idea of an agency hierarchy that you know you can have no different notions of agency also uh, sometimes you make this out more sophisticated as a four by four matrix in which case uh, but even in this case, these ideas of these distinctions between whether, what, how, why, like an external causality, why, an internal causality, how within the system, you know, they start distinguishing to be possible. I want to ask uh, my father, Edmundus, if he has a question or comment. I, but you're muted. And then I'll ask uh, Daniel. And Jerry, and maybe go back. Or Thomas, did you have a That's question not... right away? Or is your just hand up? Uh... No. Uh, I, I just want to say a lot of this was above my head. Uh, but uh, you know, the, the math here, I, I couldn't follow. But, but uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, the biology, evolution of biology was kind of interesting. Uh, what what uh, it told me there's a lot a lot of things going on a lot of random processes going on a lot of changes but yet our environment is more or less stable of course we have these viruses that show up I think that's that's part of it right uh, I mean part of the evolution uh, of uh, small bodies organisms that uh, cause uh, havoc uh, uh, amongst the population. Uh, and uh, so uh, th th there is a lot going on, yet basically it's stable. On the other hand, I mean, uh, the environment is stable. I mean, as far as we're concerned, the we, we humans, uh, but uh, something else comes to mind is uh, uh, since uh, the possibility of uh, diverse and different uh, bodies can uh, can evolve, 
I wonder if theoretically it's possible that while while we're searching for intelligent uh, life uh, elsewhere, uh, that uh, there may be some intelligent life that will show up here on Earth. I mean, not like humans, but uh, equivalent. I don't know, just random thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that's that's a bit of randomness appropriate for. Why don't uh, uh, why don't we have Daniel uh, speak and then uh, you you may have been inspired by my father also. But Daniel, what what are your thoughts? Sure. Um. Thank you, John. On a very like research interoperability layer, if these kinds of formalisms for the nested systems could be understood or mapped to like the data sets that we already have for phenotype and transcriptomics and genetics it would help integrate research so that somebody could be studying at the cellular level and someone else at the tissue level, someone else organism, population, ecosystem. And then that could be put into this nested systems approach. And then an interesting question from there would be like, what are the statistical patterns that we can test? Like, are there matrices where we can say at a given p-value, we can zero out the bottom left corner, or we test a given cell in a variety of niches, and then here's where that lower left is, the amplitude is lowest, and here's where the lower left actually does matter. Um, or here, here are some of the... Um, the patterns that relate to how cells are nested within tissues. And then do we, how do we see that similarly or differently to how populations are nested within ecosystems? Yeah, no, I think, yeah. So I, I think you've understood, you know, this, this, uh, you know, this model here. And I, I guess, yeah, there's. You know, I, I want to jump in. Uh, Sharu Nasrodis is a Lithuanian scientist who uh, developed a hierarchy of statistical classifiers, and I think that they kind of relate to the divisions of everything, where like um, the the key idea being that when you have an algorithm, you don't want it to overlearn. You want it to, uh, so you have to keep giving it a little bit of noise, just like here, you know, that uh, stuff is a little bit of noise, you keep feeding it so you can get things wrong, so that then you could have a more sophisticated algorithm that is able to learn, you know, on more advanced level and advanced level. And you have these things, and what they seem to be doing is carving up statistical space in ever more sophisticated ways, which may relate to like the type of agency hierarchies that I think Kevin Mitchell talks about. So this type of uh, the question that uh, Daniel raises, like uh, even in this two by two, it may support very different sophistications. Thomas. Yeah, I think Daniel's idea is very, very good and accurate. I think this is the way how we try to do really research. And I think others do it too. They want to look at what is constant and then to understand it better. And effectively they do, I think, what... John was proposing or what John was trying to formulate mathematically. So I think it's actually what we all do as scientists. So I was, I was going to say, um, Daniel, one, you know, uh, you were talking about p-value, but um, another way of thinking about this might be in terms of callback information, which is average surprisal rate with, you know, average surprisal rate when you actually introduce the question mark in the lower left-hand corner, like, how much difference is there between the statistical predictions with a zero left-hand corner and with a question mark left-hand corner? And if that callback information is low, it means that there's not much surprisal, which means you've got a pretty good theory. You know, so it might be a little bit more facile way rather than looking at a p-value. If you know, if you happen to have these ideas in the future, I would, uh, uh, I would maybe consider in addition to p-value, callback information as a as a possible tool to to uh, distinguish those pr predictions. And 
And uh, Kullback wrote a book about statistics and, and information theory back in the 60s. And you know, the details are in there, but it turns out this callback information is a really useful way of comparing two distributions um, in, in Thanks. terms of average, average of surprisal rate. Yeah, the, the KL divergence comes up a lot in the expected information gain um, and in surprisal and active inference. Definitely agreed, like that, the as opposed to some th thresholding, is it different or not? Um, then that would even move towards quantifying levels learning about each other and then experimenters learning about a level or experimenters learning about how levels learn about each other and maybe there are there's maybe there's biofilms that are just that only causate upwards like to come back to Jerry's original example and then they would have a kind of compositionality that would differ from a microbial community that that had a downward causation. Hmm. Daniel, are, are, do you have more like ten minutes more, or are we? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's keep. It. Okay, we'll keep going. John, yes. Oh no, I, I, you know, I really appreciate your comments, Daniel. Um, so, you know, this, uh, um, it'd be interesting. I, this germ of an idea, I, I don't, you know, I'm hoping that you find it useful, maybe. Uh, going forward is just something to think about just to see how to implement it uh again in terms of implementation in a particular system i have no idea you know i i focus on on physics and how this might be useful in physics and i've i've talked to thomas about that and andres and i think that in those two hours you know that that conversation maybe i i we talked we talked a bit about that but this is kind of my inspiration for trying to enlarge the conversation in physics around a system that is um, maybe enlarge the dynamical system, you know, to something where some of the contradictions in physics are better understood. Um, and, but that's to me a much simpler, you know, and I don't know, it, to me, it, at least in my mind, it, it seems, it seems a much simpler system than biological systems. So, uh, you know, I, in terms of ideas for how to, how to actually implement and test this on a biological system, I, I'm totally at a loss. Well, and conceptually, it's fantastic that in physics, maybe these things are very clear the way you think about it. This notion of learnability, I think many decades ago, you told me, uh, because you've thinking about this for decades, but that this whole triangular block form means that a system is learnable. And so it could be many such blocks that yeah. it's it's possible to break it down um i want to ask uh, jerry that, to, that's a good point is that that you know i talked earlier about some overarching theory of you know this breakdown and i guess i guess one word for it would be learnable um what are learnable dynamical systems you know and, um, and maybe those are like hallmarks of evolution like it's not enough just to change but um significant change is where you have a significant uh, regrouping of the niche, exactly like you're saying, like a, a real change would be carving it up, either uh, smaller or bigger, but you've re-carved up the niche, that's become stable, that becomes different. So can you reach a new stability, let's say. I want to ask Jerry for his input, and then um, I just want to uh, ask Thomas ahead of time uh, if you will think of your concluding prayer for us, because I know that it'll be a good one. So, uh, but Jerry, please. Um, uh, but you're muted right now. Right. Okay. I, you know, listening to all of this, I return back to the initial thoughts that I have about the observer observing the observer who's doing the experiments type of thing. And the notion that uh, John just mentioned a little bit ago about the possible breakdown of system and subsystem uh, descriptions relative to a plasma, or is it just the dynamics? And I, I come back to the question, suppose the large systems and the small subsystems are totally in connection or in relationship to each other. It's not a, a directional triangular going up or down. It's it's both. We are all connected to everything. And this comes back to the notion of what happens to 
physics, looking at quantum mechanics, if you assume that an electron and a proton are alive in our conscience, and all that math you're using, um, the, the spinners, the quaternions, and what have you, are really just indications of the kinds of communications that are going. And that, you know, we literally, I could be considered to be an electron. And what that means relative to descriptions of the universe and how you see things going. And this, this comes back to what I think is the, you know, maximum entropy kind of concept where you get away from doing numerical calculations because it's too complex. It's sort of what I, I get a sense of with the active inference and looking at the negative free energy descriptions. Um, and back to the experience I have out in, in nature in these big systems where you do not see the man. Um, things happen, things work, um, but you don't get models, you don't get computations, you get bird song that are pretty complex, but um, so it, it comes back to this whole question of the fundamental assumptions of connectivity and consciousness. If it's if it's widespread throughout the universe, it is the universe. How does that change these kinds of, of questions? And what I see John flirting with is, is this uncertainty with possible breakdown of system and subsystem uh, descriptions fundamentally. So anyway, that's my observations. You know, there, um, there's a book written recently about panpsychism um, by Donica. I think her name is Donica. Might be Harris, might be her last name. But uh, if you look at recent publications on panpsychism, which is the theory that every, you know consciousness is embedded, you know, fundamentally in every every um, subsystem of the universe. Uh, I don't know. I, I, are you aware of that, Jerry? Or you do? You... I'm not. No. Yeah, so I, I think it was a recent book, and and she, I think she's a uh, philosopher. Uh, maybe I, I think maybe she has some other scientific um, orientation too. But she originally wrote was going to write this book on panpsychism as a critique of panpsychism. But then when she looked more and more into it, she realized that there's some plausibility there. You got it, and well, so. It did, yeah, did it you... comes back. There are, there are lots of these kinds of ideas. And what, what you have to do is to get something that translates into real world activity uh, that you do when you start working with systems, big systems, and the failure that we have now in terms of how people are working with each other is, is the lack of that kind of, of sensitivity. So yeah, I'll take a look at it. And so um, to speak to that, uh, if we saw the importance of two by two matrices. And when I'm studying bot periodicity, really, um, and when, you know, Jerry has these intuitions about quaternions, let's say, as being of the fundamental language, but basically these two by two matrices have various symmetries. And I think that bot periodicity is basically cycling through all the symmetries and kind of showing how sophisticated they can become, just like uh, with these divisions of everything just like these statistical hier uh, hierarchy of statistical classifiers, I think that it's also expressing that. So um, when you look at that two by two matrix and you see the one corner um, that was the subsystem, in, as John talked about in his video, like that's the quantum corner. So it's very interesting. He's saying like that the quantum corner is a special uh, projection. It's just a subsystem of the classical uh, way of thinking, that the classical is actually more broader, so to speak, uh, world, and the quantum. So that speaks to what you're saying about electrons or protons. Like, yeah, that's, can... that's one possible, it's one possible theory. I mean, like, um, uh, it could be a system that, you know, ultimately that is larger than, than what we consider the classical system now, you know, I mean, so I'm not saying there's some fundamental reason why the larger well, system should but be that, classical. But that was but like your, I, your thinking was that, the, yeah. which is, so first of all, I want to say like that, that subsystem can very much be identified like with a proton or an electron. I think like the, the question is, then what does it mean all this uh, stuff too, you know, that where it's like, and is it like the electron field, you know, is it the, uh, you know, is a field 
a way that the electron mediates with its, let's say, environments and et cetera, in things like chemistry and, and then ultimately biology. But also, um, uh, one of the things that came, I think, in that video um, to recall is that if you can have this evolutionary process where the classical world manifests in this subsystem, this quantum world, but if that's how the truth works, it may say then that, well, then the, it works the other way around, that the, quant the classical world must be built up in terms of the quantum world. So you get a new picture of the quantum world, you know, that it gets a new meaning, so to speak. But then if it has a new meaning, it goes back down into the quantum world, perhaps with some more specificity, and then it goes back up. And so this type of um, refinement, which this type of refinement process, which maybe is essential for evolution to have a two-way refinement. And maybe another more clear way to say that is that if you think of that first mind big world, you know, this is arbitrary networks, but it gets reduced down to a world of concepts. There's a world of concepts, you know, or math, so to speak, like uh, it's the math world, you know, where the world where math makes sense, let's say, or concepts make sense. Then it goes back and say, well, the universe must be made of these units that are conceptually or mathematically sensible. Then you get a new universe. Then that universe goes down and say, and yeah, it's not any old kind of math. It's more these certain constraints on the math, certain symmetries and stuff. And you go back and forth. So that would be a way of, these are all ways of maybe explaining to Jerry, like, what does the math look like? What does the math evolve to, to be able to for the world to function mathematically. And that in the beginning, the world is not mathematical, but through this type of process, you start to get actual physical constants. You start to get actual you know, mathematical laws, but those laws only make sense in, in any kind of semantics, any kind of semiotics, any kind of conceptual systems only make sense with regard to subsystems. They don't make sense in the big picture. But because you have this flow with the subsystem, it transforms the big picture too. They, 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 you get this kind of iterative process. That's where this kind of suggests. And it also suggests the difference between these two minds. The big mind is this, you know, massive morass of relationships. But the second mind, the conscious, is to say, but it, the key parts of it are translatable into a language of concepts or mathematics or whatever. How does the universe become mathematical? And the, there's got to be some kind of third mind that plays with the boundary somehow, like when should the universe just do its own thing and when should the universe be mathematically sensible? I don't know. John, I don't know what you think. Of that. Well, thank you. Thank you for... Uh, okay, your, so maybe nothing to comment on. the enlightenment. <laughs> Is it time for okay. prayer? Is that time? I think okay, well, I, was gonna, I, was prayer. One, I wanted to say one thing is that how do you know um uh, is maybe related to the question, how do you know if the game is bigger than what you're currently observing? How do you know okay, that's a... when you're embedded in something, yeah. you know, there, there's some kind of trickery going oh, on cool. because you're not you're not taking in, into account everything. How does Okay, and I have, a, I have a, you know, so, so bot periodicity I, suggests an answer because what happens with bot periodicity is that you go through these stages where it becomes more and more sophisticated. And when you get to the eighth stage, it collapses. And what does it mean mathematically that it collapses? It turns out from a category theory point of view, the external relationships are the same, not mattering like how complicated the internal, you know, algebra is. So, when you realize, like, I have all this sophisticated, super sophisticated algebra at this point, but it doesn't make any difference anymore. I'm back to square one, you know, like, that's an indication of what? Well, that you've gotten back to, you know, that you've lost the thread of it. But it also says, hey, I must be in a bigger system that can just keep going, you see, but I don't transcend it. But it's like the integers, they keep going, you know, like, like the significance is lost because... You just get back to where you started, let's say, in terms of sophistication. But is that, in some sense, saying that there's going to be a maximal complexity that we have to deal with? Uh, there's going to be a maximal complexity that we're doing, but but that logic, I mean, in a certain sense, there's a way in which the complexity keeps growing. But it's it. 
but from the, I guess from the point of view of reality, right? Like in terms of like what makes a difference, it's kind of like in that case, it's literally like internal complexity. Your internal complexity can keep growing, 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 growing. But from the outer point, world's point of view, it doesn't make any uh, difference. It's just, you know, you're just cycling through certain different possibilities. So when you notice that or don't notice that, you, you notice that uh, there's something bigger going on, you know, that uh, you're repeating steps, but the world is, uh, that's a signal that there's something, you know, that there's this kind of disconnect between what you're doing and what's in this bigger world. And that's informative. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, it's something you realize and you can leverage, I think, to basically there's a God. Say. Does that point the way toward an ultimate theory that, that someday we will have an ultimate theory? Well, maybe, maybe we'll have a theory we can't escape, so to speak. I think that's the point. You know, like we'll have a theory that we just don't succeed in escaping. Like we find ourselves in this mental trap and we work very hard to, you know, try to escape it, but we realize it's just uh, difficult. You know, we don't really manage to. But we don't have such a theory right now. I think that's what the... Well, Andrew and all, thank you very much. I'm okay. signing off. Okay, yeah. good night. I enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Any, any, so this was exciting. Uh, really, uh, um, maybe towards concluding remarks to say that uh, uh, really impressive connections. I think that the th uh, thank you to Jerry, thank you to Daniel for uh, for giving us um, angles to get John going, um, and he was really great at uh, giving this all from a new biological point of view. Very little physics, so to speak, but really a lot of physical thinking. And um, uh, I think a very uh, important theme uh, came up. Um, uh, Daniel mentioned the statistical uh, way of looking at this. And actually, it was in the types of things Jerry was talking about, you know, how you have this randomness, how you have different uh, flows. Uh, so that uh, is something we'll be able to think further. Uh, Thomas, any remarks? Um, any other remarks from... So then let's, it's a, we'll conclude with a prayer then. Thomas, please. And Thomas and Edmundus, I'm, and Edmund, I'm looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks or, no, maybe. In Lithuania, not. right? Okay. We'll be, I'll tell him. Yes. Okay. Lord our God, you let us come together to discuss and think, and we are in your hands. You guide us, even if you don't see it. At least I believe that this is the case. I want to thank you for this coming together and this sharing of thoughts. And I ask you that you help us to stay in truth and respect of each other so that we are able to learn from each other and that we can continue looking for you for the ultimate truth. Amen. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. What do you get from the conversations we have together? Oh, so, you know, you've been always, always very encouraging of me uh, exploring many novel ideas, you know. So, you know, I've already, I get that from you. You know, you're sort of my, in a way over the years, been my, a bit of my conscience, uh, you know, like uh, that, Compels me to compels me to keep working. Um, and then the other aspect, I mean, I, I think there's other aspects. Like you're also very open to you know kind of novel ideas. So you know even if it's kind of some harebrained thing, like I, I think of time editing or his, history editing or something, which is really non non physical. Uh, at, at least at this point, you know you're you're at least open to that conversation.